In biological classification, subspecies is a rank below species. This term is used for populations that live in different areas and vary in size, shape, and physical characteristics, but can successfully interbreed with each other. Not all species have subspecies, but often people confuse subspecies with actual species. For example, there is only one tiger species, but there are two tiger subspecies, and these two subspecies are split up into different populations. The brown bear is another great example because this species can be found all over the world, but it is split into many different subspecies. When a subspecies goes extinct, it doesn't mean that the whole species goes extinct, and this often means that they're not seen as a priority when it comes to saving endangered species. Subspecies can really be quite unique, and in some cases subspecies can later be classified as their own separate species. Different subspecies can look very different to each other, and can also be adapted to completely different ecosystems. One of the best examples of this is the grey wolf, as it simply has so many different subspecies that can be found all over the world. Some great examples are the Arabian wolf and the Indian wolf, and even the dingo and the domesticated dog. All of these creatures live completely different lives to each other, and if one of them went extinct it would be a tragedy. This is really why we should do more to protect subspecies, and if a subspecies does go extinct it should go as a warning sign that the whole species could disappear. In this video I will be going through just a few subspecies that are teetering on the edge of extinction, as I will be going through three subspecies that are slowly disappearing. And for our first subspecies, we can head over to the Indonesian island of Sumatra, as we have the Sumatran elephant. Now this elephant is one of four recognised subspecies of the Asian elephant, and is an important member of the Sumatran ecosystem. These elephants feed on a variety of plants, and they deposit seeds as they go. This contributes to a healthy forest ecosystem, and many other animals benefit from having these elephants around. There are quite a few obvious differences between Asian elephants and African elephants, with some of the most well-known being the size of their ears and their tusks. African elephants generally have larger tusks than Asian elephants, but out of all of the Asian elephant subspecies, the Sumatran elephants tend to have the largest tusks. As I'm sure most of you are aware, this is bad news, because this makes them more of a target to poachers than the other subspecies. The Sumatran elephant is currently listed as critically endangered, with around 2,400 to 2,800 being left in the wild. At first this number may seem almost healthy, but they used to be found in much larger numbers. One of the main reasons behind this elephant's decline is habitat loss and human-elephant conflict. As the human population of Sumatra grows, it means that there is less space for these elephants to thrive. Nearly 70% of the Sumatran elephant's habitat has been destroyed in one generation, and their habitat has been destroyed either to build new settlements or to grow crops. Pulp and paper industries as well as oil palm plantations have caused the most damage, as they simply demand so much space and also create a very unhealthy monoculture environment. The growing of these crops has led to some local extinctions of these elephants, and the rapid development and deforestation in Sumatra has caused even more problems. Sumatran elephants are coming into contact with humans more and more, and this means that there's bound to be some conflict. These elephants often raid farms and homes for food, and in some rare cases they even hurt people and cause fatalities. The people affected by these conflicts often retaliate, either by poisoning or shooting the elephants. This of course makes the Sumatran elephant situation even worse, and if nothing is done they might disappear. If this wasn't enough for the elephants to deal with, as I mentioned earlier, they are also affected by poaching. And as many of the locals are not fond of these elephants, it can be very hard to find poachers and track them down. Experts believe that if the poaching and deforestation doesn't stop, the Sumatran elephant could go extinct in less than 10 years. To stop this from happening, there needs to be an effort to reduce the human-elephant conflict in Sumatra, and there also needs to be a stricter crackdown on poaching. Luckily, many organisations are currently doing this, such as the WWF. If you want to donate and help them, I've left a link down below, and hopefully the Sumatran elephant will be able to bounce back in the future. But for our next subspecies, we will be heading to southeastern Russia and northern China, as we have the Amur leopard. The Amur leopard is one of the rarest big cats in the world, and it has been extremely rare for decades. It was listed as critically endangered all the way back in 1996, and for some of you watching, this might be your entire lifetime. This just goes to show how hard it can be to save a species, as they are still in serious peril today. These leopards are adapted to a much colder climate than other leopards, and one of the best ways to differentiate an Amur leopard from a different subspecies of leopard is by their thick fur. These big cats are very well adapted ambush predators, and in the wild mostly feed on Siberian roe deer, seeker deer, and wild boar. 
Unfortunately, their range is one of the reasons why they are endangered today, because famously poaching in China is very common. It's thought that around 70% of the world's ivory ends up in China, and China's black market funds many of the poaching operations around the world. Over the years, the Amur leopard has been ruthlessly poached in China, and the story isn't much better over the border in Russia. These cats were mostly hunted for their skins that demanded a high price, but over the past few decades, this poaching has decreased massively. This decrease is mainly due down to stricter laws, because in Russia you can be fined up to 1.1 million rubles, and also be jailed for two years for killing an Amur leopard. Luckily, when it comes to this big cat, it isn't all doom and gloom, because the Amur leopard's numbers are actually increasing. In 2007, there were only thought to be around 19 to 26 individuals, and in 2019, there were thought to be around 90, and as of 2021, there are thought to be around 110 individuals. Of course, this doesn't mean that they're out of the woods yet, but hopefully if they keep growing in number, one day the Amur leopard will be safe once again. But for our final subspecies, we will be heading over to Mongolia as we have the Gobi Bear. Now as you might be able to guess by this bear's name, it is found in the Gobi Desert. This desert is a very strange and unique ecosystem, and is the sixth largest desert in the world. The temperatures in the Gobi Desert can fluctuate violently, from minus 40 degrees Celsius in the winter to 45 degrees Celsius in the summer. A desert is one of the last places you'd look to find a bear, but the Gobi Bear isn't your average bear. Although it may look very similar to the brown bears in Europe and North America, it lives a very different life. Brown bears can be very dangerous creatures, and can easily take down humans if they wanted to. Unfortunately, there are a few fatal brown bear attacks each year, but luckily if you come across a goby bear, it won't kill you to eat you. Almost all of the goby bear's diet is made up of roots, berries and other plants, but in some cases it will feed on small rodents and carrion. The Gobi bear is currently listed as critically endangered, with only around 50 bears being left in the wild. Their decline is mostly down to humans, but not in the way that you might think. Mongolia is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world, with a population of around 3.3 million. This works out to be around 2 people per square kilometre, and to put that into perspective, the US has around 36 per square kilometre, the UK has around 281 per square kilometre, and more densely populated countries such as Bangladesh have around 1,265 people per square kilometre. This means that the Gobi bear is less likely to come into contact with humans than most other brown bears around the world. Despite this, they are still affected by humans, and more specifically, our livestock. A large number of Mongolians live a nomadic lifestyle, and this often means that they roam around with large numbers of animals. These animals often overgraze in the bear's habitat, and this overgrazing leads to habitat loss, and also means there's less food to go around for the Gobi bear. This is made worse by the fact that this bear can only be found in a very small area, because they mostly live in oasis habitats. This means that they're restricted to an area of around 23,000 square kilometers, and this means that they're more vulnerable to human-related threats. To try and save these bears, a hunting ban has been in place since the 1960s, and there are also many conservation efforts. Once again, it isn't all doom and gloom for this subspecies, because their numbers have increased from 40 in 2017 to around 51 in 2022. Personally, I really hope this bear can bounce back, as it is one of the most unique subspecies of brown bear in the world. If you know of any other subspecies that could have made it on this list, then let me know down in the comments below. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.